Hello, welcome back to the History Sphere. What you're about to hear is part 23 of an ongoing series on the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. It's my intention and belief that each of these episodes will stand on its own, but if you like me and you like to have the full context of a story, those earlier episodes are available to go back and listen to in the same place you found this one. Last time. I covered the Prague Spring of 1968 and the Brezhnev Doctrine, which was a major factor in the fracturing of global communism. This week, I will cover the growing dissent inside the Soviet Union during the Brezhnev era. This is The End of History, Part 23. I have always been a voracious reader. From a very young age, I gobbled up all kinds of books. My favorites were usually nonfiction, history books, as you might have guessed, given the topic of this podcast. But I've also always been fond of fiction, and I ate up almost as many novels as I did history books. A lot of the history I was most interested in as a kid was American history. I was obsessed, and still am obsessed, with the American Civil War. And before I ever knew much about the history and culture of Russia, I was introduced to and enamored with Russian literature. First, I was introduced to Tolstoy. That was my gateway Russian author. And then Chekhov. From there, it was Dostoevsky, Lermontov, and Gogol, who I realized was actually Ukrainian, but he wrote his greatest works in Russian. Finally, I discovered some of the more recent great Russian authors, Samyatin, Bulgakov, and more. This list is inexhaustive, as there are too many to name. Russia seems to churn out great authors almost as prolifically as it does vodka and assault rifles. Literature was my gateway to a fascination with Russia that came to dominate my early adult life. I wanted to know more about the history and culture of the place that produced so many great works of high culture. I undertook the study of the Russian language, which Though I still sometimes struggle with grammar and pronunciation, I can speak reasonably well. I also read as much Russian history as I could get my hands on. And during and after college, I lived, studied, and worked in Russia. And now, here I am hosting this podcast. The journey continues. I've been pretty open about the problems I have with Russia's government, both past and present. And I've even criticized Russia's unprovoked and unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine on this podcast. I think Vladimir Putin is a bad guy, and it breaks my heart to see the direction that he is taking Russia. But in spite of their government, I really love Russia and Russians, and I make no apology for that. It's a vibrant and fascinating culture, and I've never felt more welcome in any country outside of my own. One of the most salient features of Russian people is the reverence for their literary culture, not just by the educated intelligentsia, but by nearly every person you meet, from highly educated university professors to average manual laborers, most Russians are capable of conversing with you about the complex character arcs in Tolstoy's War and Peace or the dreamlike surrealism of Gogol's Nevsky Prospekt. My own country, the United States, also has a vibrant literary culture, but your average American, at least after they leave high school, would not be keen to have a conversation about Mark Twain, Jack London, or F. Scott Fitzgerald. At various times in their history, Russian authors and artists have been treated with a reverence that Americans would associate more with rock stars than novelists. This reverence for the written word is, in short, simply inseparable from the Russian national character. It's part of what it means to be Russian. This is also one of many contradictions that we find in Russia. Great literature and reverence for the written word thrives on an open society with free expression and a free exchange of ideas. And yet, Russia has, throughout its history, had a relatively closed society and a government that, depending on the time period, has been varying degrees of authoritarian. Russia's leaders have always struggled with whether and to what degree the nation's great authors should be censored or suppressed, and whether we're talking about the Tsars of the Russian Empire 
or the general secretary in the Soviet era, the answer they usually came up with was, let's suppress them a little, but not a lot. Even Stalin famously did not have the notoriously subversive author Mikhail Bulgakov, the author of one of my all-time favorite books, Master and Margarita, arrested or imprisoned. Stalin, though he was personally responsible for banning and suppressing many of Bulgakov's works, was actually a fan of his writing, and personally stepped in to protect his position in the Soviet Writers' Union. Stalin once even defended Bulgakov as a man of singular talent, stating that he was, quote, above party words like left and right, end quote. Stalin certainly had no qualms about sending thousands of authors and other creatives to die in his gulag system if they were even mildly critical of him or his regime. But he also considered himself a lover of literature and high culture, and he made exceptions for those who he considered to be singularly talented. He probably also understood that the literary culture of Russia could not be entirely suppressed or censored, even by him. And rather than completely stifle it, Stalin and subsequent Soviet leaders sought to control it instead. They treated Russia's rebellious novelists and poets kind of like a fire. If it's kept under control and managed, it can be a useful tool. But if it's allowed to spread out of control, it will burn down the entire structure. Khrushchev's secret speech and the subsequent program of de-Stalinization brought about a renaissance not just in Russian literature, but in literature and arts across the USSR. Many works that had previously been suppressed by Stalin were allowed to be published for the first time. But as I've mentioned before in this podcast, while Khrushchev was a reformer, he should by no means be mistaken for a liberal or in any way a defender of free speech or expression. Official censorship continued. In the aftermath of the secret speech, Boris Pasternak submitted his novel, Dr. Zhivaga, to the Soviet journal Novi Mir, meaning New World, for publication. But even in the environment of relative freedom of the post-secret speech USSR, the novel went too far for the censors. Critiques of the excesses of Stalinism could now be freely published, but Pasternak's criticism of the very foundations of the Russian Revolution in Dr. Zhivaga could not be tolerated. With his novel suppressed in the Soviet Union, Pasternak took a relatively revolutionary step. He quietly passed his novel to an Italian publisher, whose agent happened to be visiting Moscow. Such a move was not entirely unprecedented, it had been utilized decades earlier by Yevgeny Zamyatin to get his dystopian novella We published, after it had failed to get past censors in the Lenin era. But Zamyatin had been ruined by this. He was only saved by the intervention of the well-connected communist author Maxim Gorky, who convinced the authorities to allow him to emigrate rather than sending him to the gulag. After Zamyatin's ruin, this tactic had rarely been tried by Soviet authors to circumvent censors and get their works published. Pasternak was likely only saved from Zamyatin's fate because of the immediate global success of Dr. Zhivaga on the world stage. Pasternak was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1958. He initially responded to the announcement with gratitude. However, When news broke that he would be awarded the Nobel Prize for a novel that remained banned in the Soviet Union, Pasternak's dacha was surrounded by the KGB, who threatened him, and threatened to re-imprison his mistress, who had previously survived the gulag under Stalin. Pasternak reluctantly, under duress, sent a telegram declining the award, stating, quote, In view of the meaning given the award by the society in which I live, I must renounce this undeserved distinction which has been conferred on me. Please do not take my voluntary renunciation amiss. The Nobel Prize Committee refused to revoke the award, announcing that the award still stood, but that the ceremony unfortunately had to be cancelled. Even after Pasternak refused the Nobel Prize, the Soviet authorities understood the poor optics of arresting or formally punishing him so he got a pass, legally speaking. His career, however, was ruined. He was systematically denounced by the party establishment. 
the party-sanctioned literary journal denounced him as, quote, a literary Judas who betrayed his people for 30 pieces of silver, the Nobel Prize, end quote. Personally, I find the use of a biblical reference by an officially atheist state institution to denounce a man, a huge part of the criticism of whom was his sympathy toward the church, is ironic. Anyway, head of the KGB, Vladimir Simichasny, was less subtle, referring to Pasternak as, quote, a pig who has fouled his own sty, end quote. Years later, during his virtual house arrest following his removal from power in 1964, Khrushchev would actually sit down and read Dr. Zhivaga. After reading it, he praised the novel and expressed regret that he ever suppressed it. Seeing how the authorities, even amidst Khrushchev's thaw, reacted to Pasternak's attempt to circumvent the official censors by having his work published abroad, a community of subversive poets in Moscow pioneered a new way of circumventing the censors. They simply printed their poems on carbon paper and handed out copies to their friends. If the poem was good, others would copy it and hand it to their friends. Sort of like those chain emails we all used to get back in the late 90s and early 2000s, except less annoying. This movement came to be known as samizdat, or self-publishing. Such works of self-publishing made their way around the Soviet Union, and were particularly popular among university students. These works were often published anonymously or under a pseudonym to protect the author from official reprisals, which if the poem was considered anti-Soviet and they were caught, those reprisals could be quite cruel. The days of Stalinism were gone, and people were not dragged away and summarily shot anymore, but they could still suffer a variety of penalties for subversive activities. These could range from being arrested and threatened by the KGB up to forced commitment in a psychiatric hospital, a practice that would become a common punishment for dissidents in the Brezhnev era, as it allowed the authorities to bypass the procedure and potential embarrassment of a criminal trial, especially in cases where the prosecutor had no evidence of an actual crime. The Soviet judiciary did not operate independently of the party or the nominal de jure government, meaning political prosecutions were common. And once the authorities decided to bring you to trial, a conviction was usually a foregone conclusion. I plan to do a full episode on the Soviet judiciary at some point in the future when I get to the reforms of perestroika, which is coming up in the not-too-distant future. For now, suffice to say that criminal defendants in the Soviet Union, on paper, enjoyed many of the same rights that they do in the United States and other Western democracies— things like the presumption of innocence and the right to counsel. But in practice, those rights were not respected. Especially in high-profile cases, Soviet authorities were not keen to have such trials take place in the public view, because especially after the birth of the Soviet human rights movement in the late 60s and early 70s, it became a popular tactic of dissidents charged with crimes to publicly expose the hypocrisy and lawlessness of the government pointing out that the government was breaking its own laws and violating its own constitution by failing to provide for a fair and impartial trial. The regime could avoid this kind of public embarrassment by simply having a Communist Party psychiatrist diagnose the dissident with some kind of quote-unquote antisocial personality disorder and having them committed. In the Soviet system, when someone was deemed insane, they lost even the minimal civil rights enjoyed by criminal defendants and prisoners, such as meetings with counsel, visitation with family, and correspondence communication with the outside world. The wider world eventually caught on to this practice, and in 1983, the Soviet Union withdrew from the World Psychiatric Association, preempting their impending expulsion from that organization, and the Soviet psychiatrists who engaged in the practice became pariahs in the global profession. The Khrushchev thaw hit its peak, in the literary sphere at least, in 1962, when Alexander Solzhenitsyn's A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, the novel which recounted the bleakness of an ordinary day in the life of a gulag prisoner as he suffered through the worst horrors of Stalinism, without any hope that his suffering would be remediated or even noticed by the party which was complicit in his suffering. In 
The novel had initially been suppressed by the official censors, and was only published after it was reviewed personally by Khrushchev and approved for publication. The novel's publication seemed to open a dam of sorts. Still less than a decade removed from the death of Stalin, millions of former Gulag prisoners were alive and, as part of the de-Stalinization program, had been reintegrated into Soviet society. Though their ordeal in the Gulag was over, the trauma of the experience and the official censorship kept them from sharing the details of their ordeal with the wider public, which in many ways was still rather ignorant of the worst parts of Stalin's terror state. Mikhail Gorbachev, whose father had been imprisoned in the Gulag, later remembered that he overheard him talk about it once to his mother and grandparents immediately after his release, and after that, he never spoke of it again. Like millions of others, he buried the experience deep down and did his best to get on with life. Solzhenitsyn's A Day in the Life resonated with many former Gulag prisoners who, when it was published with official state approval, now felt safe coming forward with their own stories. Hundreds wrote and attempted to publish or simply self-publish their own Gulag memoirs in the immediate aftermath of A Day in the Life. The public devoured Solzhenitsyn's work and the works inspired by it, and the truth of the terror state, while it had been known for some time, was openly talked about, and in a way, processed and understood for the first time. Khrushchev started to become alarmed at the public response, as much of the commentary was perceived not just as anti-Stalin, but anti-Soviet the former being the goal, but the latter being completely unacceptable in Khrushchev's worldview. He stepped back the policy of openness when it came to discussion of the gulag under Stalin. Those works that had already been published were not officially censored or suppressed, but the party did its best to limit their circulation in official channels. Similar works that had not yet been published were suppressed, and the party took the official stance that Since the party had already itself exposed the abuses of the past and corrected them, any further efforts at exposition and discussion of the horrors of the gulag were superfluous. Basically, the official argument of the Communist Party was, we already fixed that. Why are we still talking about this? When Khrushchev was ousted in 1964 and replaced as general secretary by Leonid Brezhnev, much of the openness of the thaw as limited as it was, was rolled back. Brezhnev never sought to take the USSR back to the days of Stalin's outright terror. Some of his harsher critics, including Dmitry Volkogonov, the Soviet military officer and historian, and later defense advisor to Russian President Boris Yeltsin, have suggested that Brezhnev harbored hardcore Stalinist impulses, and would have taken the USSR back there if he could have. Volkogonov's book is an important source for some of my recent episodes, but as I have mentioned before, I generally disagree with his take on Brezhnev. Brezhnev was the consummate centrist. He gravitated to the middle like water flows downhill. He could see as well as anybody that excessive tyranny was not the way to the calm and stability that he so craved. But nor did he think what he saw as the excessive reforms and openness of Khrushchev were the way to go. He believed this openness caused instability and opened the door to chaos. The toothpaste had to go back in the tube. People were generally not imprisoned during the Brezhnev era for telling a subversive joke to a friend, but the days where writers and university students could gather in Moscow's Pushkin Square and publicly read subversive poetry as they had done throughout the early 1960s during Khrushchev's thaw, those days were over too. In some ways, Brezhnev took official censorship even further than Stalin had. Stalin had often imprisoned or just outright murdered his critics and those who were seen as subversive. But as the Constitution of 1936 that he had promulgated and supported himself guaranteed freedom of speech and expression, he was almost always careful to find another excuse to prosecute public figures, even if it was completely contrived. In 1966, the government took the unprecedented step of staging a public show trial of two writers, Andrei Sinyavsky and Yuli Danyo, where both were prosecuted for the content of their writing, 
The formal charge, since their short stories had been published in Western Europe, was, quote, spreading anti-Soviet propaganda, end quote. The prosecution was poorly considered, as the defendants had not actually broken any Soviet laws, and the authorities were only able to secure a conviction in the case by corrupting the trial, which was public, in every way possible. They threatened defense attorneys to dissuade them from representing the accused, the judges refused to admit most of the evidence offered by the defense, and disallowed almost all of their witnesses, and the prosecution proceeded to present the works published by the defendants with what historian Geoffrey Hosking describes as flat-footed literalness. The Soviet public was not fooled, and when Sinyavsky was sentenced to seven years in a labor camp and Daniel to five, the response, though somewhat subdued due to the new atmosphere of censorship and repression, was outrage, especially from educated professionals, who at this time were beginning to make up a larger and larger portion of Soviet society. Where higher education had once been a relative rarity, especially in the years before World War II, the years after the war had seen a massive expansion of the accessibility and indeed the quality of higher education in the USSR. Regardless of your opinion of the regime, one must give credit where it is due, and count this expansion of higher education as one of the successes of the Soviet system. It was a double-edged sword for the party, however. While the pipeline of high-quality universities and technical schools helped to churn out qualified professionals who propelled the Soviet Union to unprecedented heights in science and the arts, it also produced a new generation of Soviet citizens who were highly educated and trained to think critically. To be sure, they were still steeped in party slogans and were forced to spend a significant portion of their time studying party ideology and Marxist-Leninist theory, but those educated in the hard sciences especially were on the cutting edge and allowed to critically analyze the latest theories from outside the Soviet Union. This scientific freedom, like artistic freedom, however, was rolled back by the conservative counter-reforms of Brezhnev. Soviet scientists who, even under Stalin, had been given relative academic freedom because of their indispensable role in the military-industrial complex, were now increasingly restricted from publishing in or even accessing foreign scientific journals or collaborating with foreign scientists from non-socialist countries. As these restrictions were gradually placed on the scientific community in the late 60s and early 70s, a number of Soviet scientists joined writers and other creatives in pushing back against the repressive state. So by the early 70s, these dissidents from the artistic and scientific communities were ripe to coalesce, and they just needed a singular cause to rally around. That cause came in 1968, and was the subject of last week's episode, the Prague Spring and its subsequent crushing by Soviet and Warsaw Pact allied forces. On August 25th, 1968, something materialized on Red Square in Moscow not seen since the early days of the revolution. A peaceful, public demonstration against the actions of the government. Eight individuals, Larisa Bogaraz, Konstantin Babitsky, Vadim Delonia, Vladimir Dremyuga, Pavel Litvinov, Natalia Gorbanevskaya, Viktor Feinberg, and Tatyana Bayeva gathered at 12 noon with signs expressing solidarity with Czechoslovakia. At the urging of the others, the youngest, Tatyana Bayeva, told the authorities that her presence was accidental and coincidental. She was released with a warning. The other seven were put on trial for spreading anti-Soviet propaganda. Viktor Feinberg had been severely beaten and had all his teeth knocked out while under interrogation by the KGB, and for reasons of optics, he did not appear at the trial. He was quietly committed to a psychiatric hospital, in the fashion I discussed before. Of the other six, five were sentenced to between three and five years of exile in remote Siberian settlements. And Natalia Gorbanevskaya was released, but later quietly also committed to a psychiatric hospital. Their punishments were less severe than those suffered by the dissident authors a few years earlier, but the injustice nonetheless shone through, and their punishment became a shared focus of the still fractured dissident groups in the USSR. Mainly, these groups focused on the fact that 
what the so-called Red Square 7 had done was not technically illegal. They pointed to Article 125 of the 1936 Soviet Constitution, which stated, quote, In conformity with the interests of the working people, and in order to strengthen the socialist system, the citizens of the USSR are guaranteed by law freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, including the holding of mass meetings, freedom of street processions and demonstrations. These civil rights are ensured by placing at the disposal of the working people and their organizations, printing presses, stocks of paper, public buildings, the streets, communications facilities, and other material requisites for the exercise of these rights. End quote. They also pointed to Article 19 of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of which the USSR is one of the initial signatories, which states, quote, Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers, end quote. Following the self-publishing model created by subversive poets in the early 60s, this nascent human rights movement founded an underground journal titled Chronika Tekushich Subiti, which translates into English as the innocuous-sounding Chronicle of Current Events. This journal simply published incidents where Soviet authorities violated their own laws and principles, typically but not exclusively in the realm of judicial procedure and freedom of expression. Numerous editors and contributors to the journal were arrested and imprisoned, exiled, or locked away in psychiatric hospitals over the years, but the decentralized nature of the publication meant that the authorities could not shut the journal down. It continued to publish regularly for over 14 years, until it was finally shut down and destroyed by the KGB in 1983. Around the same time, several underground clubs or societies dedicated to human rights were formed. Famously, the renowned Soviet physicist Andrei Sakharov co-founded one of the more influential groups alongside another scientist and a writer, Valery Chalidze, demonstrating the informal alliance between writers and scientists at the head of the Soviet human rights movement. This group was called the Committee on Human Rights in the USSR. Like other similar groups, the Committee on Human Rights was eventually infiltrated, discredited, and destroyed by the KGB under the leadership of future General Secretary Yuri Andropov. The cat was out of the bag, so to speak, by this point, and new groups usually led by prominent scientists and writers continued to pop up faster than the KGB could root them out. The movement was accelerated in 1975, after Brezhnev, in one of the crowning achievements of his foreign policy of detente with the West, signed the Helsinki Accords. The Helsinki Accords in terms of international relations are not really anything to write home about. At least they weren't at the time they were signed in 1975. Twenty years later, they would serve as the framework for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. But that's a story for another day. At the time, it was merely a non-binding expression of shared values signed by both the Western democracies, including the United States, and the Eastern Bloc countries, including the USSR. Importantly, however, paragraph 7 of the resultant Helsinki Declaration expressed that each signatory committed itself to, quote, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief, end quote. It was not legally binding, but to the growing human rights movement in the Soviet Union, it represented a renewed commitment by their government to the principle of freedom of expression, a principle that in practice, they continued to fall woefully short of. In the aftermath of the Helsinki Declaration, the so-called Helsinki monitoring groups began to spring up all across the USSR. These groups followed a similar model to earlier human rights groups like the Committee for Human Rights, except that their express purpose was to monitor how well the Soviet government was living up to its commitment in Helsinki, and then report those findings to the other signatory states. Read The Capitalist West. The KGB at first employed the same cloak-and-dagger tactics it had to shut down earlier human rights groups, but the Helsinki movement, going back to my earlier analogy, had become like a fire that was raging beyond their ability to control. 
and the only option left to the KGB was to put it out entirely. They resorted to mass raids, arrests, and the inevitable trials of those involved in the movement, who, again, on paper, were not actually violating any law of the USSR. By the early 1980s, the KGB had managed to snuff out the Helsinki movement, but they were unable to destroy the ideas that fueled it. Their heavy-handed treatment of human rights activists over the last decade had exposed the utter hypocrisy of their government, not only to their own people, but to the wider world. The treatment of dissidents in the Soviet Union was roundly condemned, not only by the capitalist governments of Western countries, but by the communist parties in Western countries as well. Western communist parties that had once taken their marching orders directly from Moscow. The communist world became a little more fractured, and the once preeminent role of the Soviet Union within it diminished a little more. That's everything for today. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I want to give a big thank you and shout out to my patrons and supporters who support this show with monthly donations on Spotify and Patreon. If you're not a supporter yet, and you want to be, you can support us with a monthly donation on either of those sites. Links to both can be found on the show's website at www.thehistorysphere.com. Also on the website, you will find links to all of the show's social media, as well as a list of my sources for this week's episode. That website again is www.thehistorysphere.com. If you can't afford to donate right now, you can also support the show by subscribing and giving us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform which costs you nothing and really helps to promote the show and the algorithm. You can also help us out by telling your friends about the show. Some of you may have noticed that the episode did not come out at its usual day and time the last two weeks. Last week, that was an accident. The episode was simply late. I noticed, however, that when I released the episode on Tuesday evening, it performed significantly better in the algorithm than my previous episodes. So this week, I'm releasing the episode midweek to see if that trend holds. I'm always open to suggestions from my listener community as well, so if you have a strong preference or ideas about the timing of my episodes, you can always leave a comment or send me a message. Our community is still pretty small, so I will likely read and respond to your message personally. Next time, on the History Sphere, I will cover the topic of religion and nationality in the Brezhnev-era Soviet Union. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day.